but it's been the whole dive so far while we've been on the bottom. It's very steady. And we're at about 1,240 meters, which is 4,068 feet. Thank you, sir. I was correct. Yes, I touched that. Thank you. <laughs> so, how much part of these sea cucumbers that are from Quito are edible? I don't think they would taste very good. They most likely be like gooey, not very delicious, chewy, jelly, slime balls. They're very slimy. Um, but, um, yeah, some of these deep sea ones might have different consistency than some of the shallower water sea cucumbers. I know that some places sea cucumbers are eaten. Um, I don't think those are usually the pelagic swimming ones, but I'm not sure about that. What is this where I see general Jerry? So we're looking at one of the benthic sea cucumbers. Yeah, uh, one of these we've been seeing left off the bottom when we pass by and start swimming. And there's also a grill star just above to the left of the sea cucumber. And there he goes. Yeah. yeah, so this is actually a, a bit thick one that occasionally swims. Right. Um, usually they just swim uh, if they're startled or are avoiding a predator like Hercules. Yeah. <laughs> so These are typically bit thick as opposed to the allergic sea cucumbers that we see that have uh, overall more brown circular body shape and uh, those fins that go all the way around their body. A great feature of a pelagic or swimming sea cucumber. You can also see that darker patch on the bottom is its gut and all the little pinnacle like arms you just saw close uh, or closing in around the snout. Cucumbers, um, plans for today, and, uh, is on dependence and hemichordates, Peter Stone groups. Thursday and Friday, we'll see that some labs for the cucumbers. We have lots of different kinds of and hopefully some hemichordates will come on this day and hemichordates as well. That we should have to go on the lab. We already have a few. You've probably seen some of the turtle stars and the sea stars that we have. Already, those are from previous versions of the class. We maintain the spectrum on the third floor in the EOP, very simple to learn. And then again, Friday, the exam one will be available to Friday the on Monday. That means this time next week we won't be having a lecture. It's just to account for differences in schedule. Some of you may need schedules to where this is the period of time that you have available for that exam, so we will not have work on Monday. And then we'll continue next week with other computer stuff to explore the exam lectures and labs on courses. Our agenda for today and for today's labs, first of all, we'll see where we left off last week introduce the Kinophores. And I wanted to have a discussion about an overview about this notion of who is most faithful and we can think about what potentially that means. And then we'll have a brief introduction to Deuter Sums and Andy Aquaria, the group that includes Kinophores and germs. And then we'll probably spend the rest of today's lecture just focusing on biology of a few of the classes of the Kinophores. And then I'm sure we're not going to get to the end of the today, but we'll conclude with them on Wednesday. So, sponges versus tinnipores. This is a bent of view of the tree. There are Currently uses that places 
sponges. You know, face or group. So it's, it's a tree that shows sponges, but the interpretation is sponges are the most faithful group. And then we have right there, you see it with these platyzoans coming off. This is polytomy. So essentially, the authors of our tree saying there's no strong support for any of these groups being the most closely related to the rest of the animals or to each other, right? A polytome. And this had been our thinking for quite some time based on characteristics of sponges. Sponges, relatively simple. They lack them the complexity of other major animal groups. They don't exhibit any true tissues, no muscles or nerves. They perhaps have the oldest fossil record. I should say that the you know, the, the fossils that we talked about when we talked about sponges, those are interpreted to represent sponges. They may not actually be sponges. Some people suspect that those aren't really sponges, but represent other extinct groups. And then we talked about the chemical signature, the biomarker signatures that suggest that sponges existed during pre cambrian times. So they're a very old group. My computer's staying on, it just it seems like it's a connection. Hopefully we don't have any problems. Tenophores. For a long time, tenophores and cnidarians were grouped together in a group that was referred to as radiata or cilentorata. Radiata because of the fact that they exhibit radial symmetry and the fact that they share no the number of features in common. They, they're relatively hollow body. Mesically, it's largely acellular, the jelly component to these groups. They only consist of two tissue layers, diploblastic instead of triploblastic. And of course, the fact that they exhibit radial symmetry, where most other groups tend to exhibit bilateral symmetry. So these were often grouped together into the same group. These were the superphylum names that were given to that particular group. One of the earliest or earlier molecular phylogenetic analyses of early animal evolution, Monica Medina and co authors in 2001, derived sequences from a variety of different eukaryotes. We see fungi out here coenoflagellates out here, another group that is closely related to us, mesomycetosoids are here. So these represent outgroups. Bilaterians are here with some snails and flatworms and urchins and frogs. And what we can see, the very, the very early interpretation, and it confirmed what we suspected about sponges being the most basal. Peripheral here, and then some very short branches showing that tenophores are the sister to a clade containing cnidarians and bilaterians. So this showed a couple of things. It suggested that sponges and these are the most basal group. It also showed that grouping tenophores together with cnidarians is it accurate? Does it reflect their history? Their common ancestor is also the common ancestor of the bilaterians as well. Two thousand eight, in which you know, the previous one only looked at ribosomal RNA gene sequences, so you were just talking about a few thousand bases that they examined. Casey Dunn and a variety of other co-authors developed large data sets 
based on essentially transcriptomes, messenger RNA expressed by these different animals. And they're looking at the tree of life. And again, we already talked about this in an earlier lecture, but one of the major results was the phenophores of the curlews. This was shocking. And we've seen this already, where if you look down here, phenophores are the sister for the rest of the animals. And the sponges fall out here, and actually this tree supports them being the sister group for the Minarians. Very different than what we had anticipated. Immediately following that, another group revealed the traditional view. So they again used large data sets to examine the relationships of these animal groups. Here are the outgroups falling out here. Sponges are the most basal, and they actually recover, as we discussed earlier, Solenterata, which are also known as radiata, that Tinophores and Nidarians are sisters. What you should notice from many of these trees I'm showing you, some of these very early branches are relatively short. That suggests that very little evolutionary change represented on those branches, right? So there are very few differences really amongst these groups. So why do we get different trees depending on what data we used or what analyses we used? If I put each of you in charge of a project to evaluate the relationships of sponges, tenophores, and the rest of the animal to determine which of these is the most basal. Do you think you would all come up with the same result? Based on what we've seen already? No. Why not? Part of it can be because the early divergence of these groups was so rapid that it's hard to reconstruct those early relationships. Part of it can be that one of you used a different model of gene evolution than another did in your tree. So using different approaches, even with the same data, can reveal different tree topologies. This hasn't been left behind. That last paper wasn't the final word on everything. Additional authors, and some of the same people are here, Dickie Dunn, who was the lead author of the earlier paper, the first paper that showed that sponge, or sponges were not the most basal group, that tenophores were, then sequenced the genome of a tenophore and compared it to sequences of other animal groups and outgroups. And again, strongly supported, this is just a summary tree, strongly supported tenophores as being the most basal. Nathan Whelan and his co-authors, 2015, gathered different data and tried to evaluate what could be the problem with the different interpretations. Their findings, again, supported genophores being most basal and sister to the rest of the animals, and suggest that there may be methodological errors that are associated with sponges being most basal and other analysis. Nathan and a different set of co-authors had more data and again shows a strong support of tenophores being the system. Again, not the final word on any of this. There isn't a final word. 2017, similar set of authors that made this argument before. Larger data set supports sponges being most basal. Tenophores, the next most faithful group, and so forth. There haven't been, or at least what I've been able to explore, there haven't been a lot of new data sets, new analyses that have been conducted, except for this one by Redmond and McLeisett in 
2021, the state examined large data sets from various animals. And again, they attempted to evaluate what may be responsible for the different interpretations that people get. And they're using different data sets or even the same data sets with different methods. And they conclude from everything that they've looked at that the best support is for sponges being the most baseball group. And then suggest, this is a summary slide, the end of the paper, suggests that these relationships are the ones that are now controversial that we need to focus on. I haven't seen a response yet from Casey Dunn or Nathan Leland or any of the co-authors of those earlier papers that strongly support Tinafort being the most faithful group, but I'm sure in the coming years we will have alternative views coming out. I think as, as a zoologist, an evolutionary biologist, I find keeping up with this stuff kind of rather taxing because it's changing. This is good in some cases because we can make new interpretations that previously we weren't able to make based on new phylogenetic information. But in the cases like these, where it's flip-flopping back and forth, it's, you know, I don't know what to say to you all about who is the most faithful group. Frankly, I'm not sure if we'll have a situation by which we are 100% sure of one hypothesis or the other. That's the nature of science, right? But part of all this comes down to what does it imply about the evolution of characteristics within animals? So we have tenophores being most basal, or we have sponges as being most basal. We can think about the features. You know, why is this the traditional view? Because it suggests a number of features that occur within these groups evolved in the common ancestor of that group. That's why this is the most comfortable view. This view is intriguing because it suggests that some of these features may have evolved in the common ancestor of all animals and then were lost by the sponges or they were independently derived in tenophores and in Iberians and Phylogenetics. So different views on how these different traits evolve. If we can't rely on molecular phylogenetic results to differentiate between these hypotheses, what else might we be able to do? To determine which may be the correct hypothesis. These are, I'm not going to answer these, but these are things that you've been considering. How we might go about that. But no time change. Time change. Okay. All right. So I'm doing kind of I think I have so many. Things I could give about a kind of um, for some reason, both my um, PhD advisor and postdoctoral advisor, they both worked on a kind of I've worked in a kind of labs a lot. I've been involved in projects focusing on a kind of but I've never focused on them specifically for my own research. But I love a kind of and I lots of stuff that cool things I've learned about them, or that things that are that are reminded in reading the text or different experiences I've had with them. Well, I'm going to hear from you all. What is something interesting you learned about any kind of Or I should say, I don't have many interesting things I'll talk about any but I do have lots about any kind of What do you know about any kind of or any cortex that you learned from the chapter reading or you've had a cool experience with? Are you questioning <laughs> the idea of catch collagen? You stole mine, yeah. <laughs> catch collagen, do you want to explain what that is? Um, collagen that can go from liquid to a solid to help you hold a position without having to rely on your muscles too much. So. Yeah, so echinoderms have a unique aspect to their morphology. Their body wall is made up of the serum, 
that is comprised of, of calcium carbonate fossicles and the collagenous fibers. And those collagenous fibers are capable of taking either a stiff or soft form to them. They're, they're mutable. They're able to be changed. And it's typically under nervous control that they can alter whether or not they're stiff or soft. That's, that's one of the very cool features that they have. And one of the stories I have related to that is in Hawaii, there are two species of echinoderms that live burrowed into rocks. And there's multiple species throughout the Indo-West Pacific, but just two in Hawaii. And occasionally, they will hybridize in Hawaii. So the one is like a pink color, the other one is like a dark black brown color. And the hybrids tend to be like this intermediate color, the light brown color. So when you find one in the field, you know you've got it. The problem is actually removing it from the habitat. Is there any little burrows that there's spines? And when they're just sitting there and, and not being bothered, they're relaxed. How do you get them out of that little burrow? We have these big screwdrivers that we would use. And my vines are usually have rewards if we captured a hybrid, because he was interested in doing experiments with them. So we go out to the field with a screwdriver, and you have to be fast. You have to pop it out before it made that collagen stiff. Because when it made that collagen stiff, those spines were attached, or not attached, but holding on to the sides of that rock little crevice. There's no way you're going to get it out of there. You can't, and you're not going to, you know, we never sat around and waited because it presumably would take 15, 20 minutes, an hour before they relaxed again. So oftentimes if we didn't get it on the first try, we were lost. So it's an amazing feature that the kind of germs exhibit. Something else from the book. Yeah. It's not something that I learned, but I have trispected a sea cucumber before. A sea cucumber? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you have all the cool pictures. That is so cool. So the friend of your bulb? Yeah, that's for example. That's what it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many gonads did you find? Um, two of the hermaphrodites, so it's on um It was a hermaphrodite? Yep. Yeah. Really? Yep. Hermaphroditic sea cucumber? I did not know they included as hermaphrodites. That is really cool. What'd you do the dissection in? Um my community college, my zoology class. Oh fantastic. That is so cool. And, and any cool things that you learned when you're doing I mean, the hermaphroditic aspect is bizarre, but... It feels happens. very leathery and very slippery at the same time. It's very tough to cut through. Yeah. And they're very delicate. Cool. One thing Hay talked about in the video we saw right before the class was, you know, the edible nature of sea cucumbers. And there are sea cucumbers featured on menus around the world. Um, I think in Costco, I saw Last year, I haven't done a Costco recently, but I saw last year they were selling bags of dried sea cucumber. I didn't buy any for the class because it was like 50 bucks for a bag of dried sea cucumber. So the delicacy and it's quite expensive. Heather, anything else from the text or your experiences there? Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting how there's some species that can be like basically discharge their organs at the extent of and, and we're focused on sea cucumbers. Sea cucumbers can do that. They can, they can, you know, eviscerate their fat and their gonads and their respiratory trees and all that to avoid predation, and then they grow it back. So that's that's a great strategy to use to avoid predation. Some of them too um, will utilize special tubules that are attached to the respiratory tree, and. When they're bothered, they'll, the respiratory tree is associated with the cloaca, which is associated with the anus, so it's the, the tail end of the beast. And they, you know, when they're bothered, they'll move their rear end towards the predator or whoever's happening to bother them, and then they will break the cloaca, the internal part of the cloaca will break, and they'll use pressures to force out these tubules they, through the respiratory tree they're attached to that will pump water into them so that they elongate, and then they get very sticky. Tubularian tubules, they're called. The book mentions those. And interesting story about those, um, I've heard of uh, 
people in the Western Pacific, when they're out exploring the reef, looking for food and so forth, they've traditionally used these sea cucumbers that they have the cuvierian tubules to secrete the tubules on their feet. Very sticky, and then it provides protection for their feet while they're walking on the reef. And it tells you about how thick and how good of a defensive strategy that can be to either eviscerate antigens or but to eviscerate all your guts, or just to eviscerate or to, to eject certain tissues. Anything else? There's so many cool things about these. Did anyone know about sea daisies before? Whatever I read about sea daisies from the text, I get intrigued by these, these little small starfish, they're sea stars that are related to asteroids, the sea stars. But they appear to be you know, a, a modified form that may represent retained juvenile characteristics in the adults. It is a circle, and they have two feet running around the periphery of the body. So it's just an intriguing type of, of sea star. Anything else? All right. I have lots of other things right now, but we need to move. Okay, so here again, it's a reminder of the changes to kind of show where we've been. We've covered these top four, King of Sea and Mars. We'll cover them when we talk about the backwards. But we're jumping in to the deuterostomes, which include us. So basically, today we're going to be talking about hepatidomes and hemichordates. And then next week, talk about the chordates. What do we remember? What, what is unique? about the deuterostomes. What characteristics do deuterostomes possess? A true coelum? They have a, they have a true coelum, and so too do many of the protosomes, but not all. They have, what, do you remember what type of true coelum? How does their coelum derive versus true coelums that we find within protosomes? Talked about this during development. <laughs> so remember, we have acealous animals, um, such as flatworms within the protostomes. Acealous, they have no coelom. Pseudocealous, fake coelom, a coelom, a body cavity that is not completely lined by a mesoderm. And then we have things like mollusks and annelids that have a true coelom. That is lined by mesoderm that is formed by splitting of the mesodermal tissue during the development of the embryo. So schizocele. Within deuterostomes to form their true coelomates, and a coelom formed by outpocketing of that early gut cavity. So enterocelous. So deuterostomes are enterocelous. What other features do deuterostomes possess? Many of it related to aspects of development, shared developmental pathways. The name itself, right? Deuterostome, second mouth. The last of four. In the gastrulation stage, the first opening forms the anus. Second opening forms the mouth, right? Deuterostome. Anything else, deuterostomes? about cleavage. One of the things we talked about with comparison of deuterostomes and protostomes is that they tend to differ in the cleavage patterns of the cells. Deuterostomes undergo radial cleavage, where the cell divisions occur parallel 
are perpendicular to the axis of cell divisions, whereas the protostomes undergo spiral cleavage, where you have them not occur parallel perpendicular, they're at acute angles. One way to re recall spiral cleavage is to think about snails. So we have snails are protostomes that exhibit spiral cleavage. And depending on how, whether or not it's clockwise or counterclockwise in terms of that angle of cell division, you may have a left-handed or a right-handed snail. The shell foils one way or the other. Our book shows that too. Here, mouth not derived from the last form. The name of the group, the stones, interestingly, radial cleavage. Also, many deuter stones exhibit what is determined or what is described as being determinate cleavage. Cells at very early stages in the embryo can be separated, and they would develop into complete individuals, where if you do that to a protostome, you're going to end up with embryos that are not capable of developing. That's why we have twins. We have separation of those early cells in the embryo. The other feature that we haven't talked about, but the gill slits that we find in chordates, and we find in some hemichordates, the worm-like hemichordates, the endrophists, or acorn worms in those. Those are these are two main groups. So very good question. What are endrophists? They are a group of hemichordates, the worm-like hemichordates that are free-living, whereas parabranchs are colonial hemichordates that typically live in tubes. So the two main groups of hemichordates, these have a little gill force, talk more about them on Wednesday, but they're a feature of these, not found in there, so presumably they've been reduced or lost within the terebranchs, and then lost within the kinetics. So a number of features that are unique to deuter stones. Deuter stones, too, are supported by molecular phylogenetics. And this is the overall relationships that are inferred. One thing that can be confusing, and I've, I've done this before where I've included hemichordates in our chordate lab, and I feel so guilty about doing that because hemichordates are close relatives of echinoderms. The term hemichordate, half chordate, refers to the fact that they exhibit these gill pores. They do exhibit a few other structures that chordates show, but they, so that's why their name, hemichordate, they're somewhat like the chordate, but they're not the closest relative of the chordates. The closest relative of the chordates is this group, ambulatory, that includes dependents and hemichordates. Oh, and I have this as a reminder for the differences between the protostomes and deuter stones, one thing you have to remember here too is that these are protostomes that exhibit coelom, true coelom. There are, of course, other protostomes, the flatworms, nematodes that are that do not have a coelom or don't have a true coelom, they have pseudo. So Angulacraria is this clay that is a sister to the chordates that includes the echinoderms and the hemichordates. It's actually a clade that only recently was re-recognized because in the mid-90s, molecular data came out that supported the close relationship between hemichordates and echinoderms. Previously, it was inferred that echinoderms were either subphylum within the chordates or at least closer related. 
The name, though, dates back to the late 1800s, when zoologists who were studying these recognized that hemichordates, some hemichordates and some chondrons, exhibit similar larval types with these ciliary bands around them. It was also inferred, we haven't talked about this yet, but echinoderms have a unique internal system that is associated with movement of, of fluids, the water vascular system. It was assumed that there was a relationship between the water vascular system and the pores that were present within many cortex. So even in the 1800s, this name was proposed to account for the grouping for hemicordates and it kind of kind of dismissed for boy, almost more than 100 years until finally molecular results showed strong support for this particular group. So their main shared feature, the bicanary larvae of asteroid, sea star, and tornarian of the acorn worms, the endropods, are very similar in terms of their overall structure. The fact that they have ciliary bands distributed throughout them. Now, slightly different orientation of the anus, but overall similarity in morphological features of larval stages. These were done. These early investigations were done back in the 1880s. This is following Darwin's notions about evolution. So lots of people were interested in development and using understanding how species may be related, groups may be related, based on shared developmental features. So there was a huge boon in studies of marine larvae during that period. to do for the echinoderm lectures, I'm briefly going to introduce echinoderms, what their, their shared features are, and so forth. Then we're going to have a discussion comparing aspects of the anatomy of starfish, sea stars, and brittle stars, so asteroids and ophoroids. We're all going to talk about the frictions, the sea cucumbers, and the crinoids. I don't think we'll get to these two, and possibly this one. We made it partially through the economics today. So we kind of, kind of dramata. We have sea cucumber here, brittle stars, asteroids, urchin. We don't have any crinoids. But the group includes five extant classes. Snake-like movements of the brittle star's arms. The stars. Echinoidea, kino, and derm, spiny skin, these so spiny, these are. 
sea urchins, which are the regular types of echinoids, there are also irregular echinoids, irregular urchins, such as sand dollars. Sea biscuits, hard urchins, those types of things that tend to have bilateral symmetry as opposed to radial symmetry, which is regular urchins possess. Holophoroidia, which I'm not sure how would that name this way, but it kind of means a complete, literally means complete entrance, or this kind of word derivation. I'm not sure why. Uh, these are the sea cucumbers, which are rather distinct in that they are greatly elongated along their oral mountainside, they have the oral side opposite of the mountain axis, so they're greatly elongated, they're a worm-like type of animal. These are all marine. Somewhere around 7,500 species. Their fossil record dates back to the Cambrian. There are several different classes of the kind of herbs recognized as fossil records that, are, that went extinct at the end, by the end of the Paleozoic and don't occur today. But they have a rather rich fossil record. Their body plan. is unique for several region, reasons. They have an endoskeleton calcareous ossicles. It's part of this, this stem which has catch collagen, we discussed at the beginning of class. Most, uh, not all, exhibit pentaradial symmetry, penta, pentagraph, five sides. Five sides, so five fold symmetry. We think of a starfish, for example. For echinoderm, this pentaradial symmetry represents a derived feature. What do I mean by that? And if it's the derived feature, what was the ancestral feature? What was the ancestral symmetry? So what I mean by derived, how is, how is it derived? Very good. So that it's something developed from an ancestral state. What was the ancestral state? Yeah. Bilateral symmetry. Bilateral symmetry. So this represents the derived condition, ancestral condition, bilateral symmetry. I'm not going to go back to that damn tree, but remember this this is a group within bilaterium. So if we map character states onto the tree, we would see that ancestrally. It was, it had an ancestor that was bilaterally symmetrical. So I think I write it too, I'm sorry. You have to listen when I, when I write, I, mean, I can sometimes barely understand what I've written, if I've written it too long ago. Bilateral symmetry. What evidence do we have 
aside from looking at a tree, that it kind of nerfs our bilateral, symmetrical, ancestral. Oftentimes, and I just mentioned this in setting the look for our character states amongst early developmental stages of organisms. Early developmental stages of echinoderms, the larval stages, do not exhibit pentaradial symmetry. They exhibit bilateral symmetry. The pentaradial symmetry is then developed by later life cycle stages, juvenile and adult stages. is the tree from our text. And what it shows is, is the entire phylum here. We have two different subgroups within a kind of dermata. Helmatozoa, these were attached animals essentially. Helmato, attached. Lutherozoa can be translated into free living animals. These are free living. Most primates, not all, but they tend to attach to stock. And then it includes some of the earlier groups. Then exhibited, these are fossil groups that are now extinct. Oftentimes, when you see the little cross like symbol by the name of an organism, it indicates that it is extinct. Extinct groups. These are all extinct groups that went extinct by the end of the Paleozoic. So we can look at some of the evolution of these features within echinoderms. And the skeleton of calcite plates is present within these extinct plates. External cilia grooves for suspension feeding, three ambulacral grooves for some of these things we'll discuss when we're discussing aspects of the anatomy of these. The evolution of the water vascular system. So it occurred in some echinoderms, but not all. There are extinct forms, it occurs in all extant classes. Pentaradial symmetry now evolves in the common ancestor to all the extant classes. These did not have, even some of these beasts had asymmetric body forms. It's further broken down into to other plates, these are not named here, they do have formal names, we won't bother with them, but a group containing asteroids and ultroids that possess a similar fibron state, and then echinoids and ultroids, which exhibit an extension of their ambulacral areas throughout the entire body. We'll talk about these things when we go on. But again, these trees are wonderful because they summarize lots of information about the members of the larger. Asteroids and ophroids represent two different classes. Of the kind of germs, rather large classes. Asteroids, there's somewhere around 1900 species. I think the book says about 1500, but at least the number of described, accepted, recognized species is 1900s. Ultra-wise, brittle stars. want us as a classroom to focus on what are the major differences between these two groups. So if we compare them, 
There are obviously things that have shared in common. There are a number of features, though, that are distinct between the two groups. So, what I want to do for the next five minutes is for you to assemble with somebody nearby you and see. If you look at these images, there's a few things you could infer from them. But if you read the text, you also are already familiar with some of the differences between these two groups. But to discuss with somebody nearby you for the next five minutes, it's 1048 or 1053, we'll reassemble as long as there's some discussion and see if we can come up how these things differ from each other. All right, so it's fine. Hopefully you don't have to physically move, but chat with the neighbor and try to identify the things that differ between asteroids and ocean. Some things you can see on this image.
I mean, I appreciate it. For those who've read the text, you should know a lot of these differences. If you didn't read the text, you may not know them, but you can look at these images to come up with some of the differences. So what are some of the differences that you all have discussed? Yes? Um, so it looks like the Astros have like two different types of stomachs, and then the opioids just have like stomach palpitations. Stomachs. Stomachs. So, Now that we're on digestive system, let's, let's tackle this completely. What else can we say about the digestive system? We don't have the internal anatomy shown here, but where is the stomach in these beasts? In the central, in the central region. Yes, in the central region. So it's restricted the central disc region of the body. Where's the stomach in these guys? Stomachs, I should say. So it occurs in the central If we did a cross section of this arm, no stomach. If we did a cross section of this arm, stomachs. What else? What about the digestive tracts of these organisms? What does the digestive tract of a starfish look like? Where is the mouth? bottom surface of the animal. I 
typically the mouth end of these animals is referred to as the oral end, as opposed to the aboral end, which is just simply the mouth aside from where the mouth is. So their mouth is on the bottom surface. What about the ophroids? Where is their mouth? In the same place, not a difference. Mouth, talk about the stomachs already. That's the end of the digestive tract. Referred to it. Anus, right? And uh, head of words, too. You can use that's the appropriate one. Um, where's the anus on Caesar? Central disc. Where is the anus on the anus for asteroids? It's on the aboral surface. So it's got a complete digestive tract. Mouth on the bottom, anus on top. What about ophiolus? You don't know Very good. They have no anus. Undigested materials come back round again through the mouth. Reminiscent of my nerves. Unique feature of all joints. All editors who kind of learn classes and snap ones have a complete digestive tract. Throughout the brain is unique for the ultra. Why? Is there any of the digestive features that I'm missing? No. Those are some of the major differences. What else did different groups come up with? Anything morphologically about? Uh, I think the asteroids don't have very much of their uh, They have their what? Their zone has oh. Oh, Okay, so reproduction. Another major function of organisms. Cycle of asteroids versus ophiolites. We'll show up lots more later, but they have different larval states. And as we'll see, those of the ophiolites. Larvae, larval stages of actinoids. They are pluteus larvae, or plutei. Let's see, and subsequent slides. What else? So we got aspects of digestive system, reproduction. What about movement? Ever watched a piece of or a brittle star movement? We have some brittle, we have both 
we were in. How do they move? Our asteroids are there two feet. Two feet, we haven't talked about this, we will, but the water vascular system, this unique system with many craters, we can see the two feet emerging here. There are pores from which two feet emerge here. Asteroids use their two feet for moving. They're suckers, they have suckers on them. There are muscles that allow for pulling up of the inner, inner part of that circle of the bottom of the two feet that allows for it to grab onto something. They use their two feet to move. to these arms and kind of the snake-like movements, the snake-like appearance and the movements that they exhibit. Ophiroids move by moving their arms. Two feet are present. But they don't have Suckers, presumably they lost that characteristic. Any other features? You don't see it in the picture. So one thing related to so we're talking about movement aspects of two feet. I guess just not a function, but a characteristic. Both of these possess a water vascular system. The water vascular system, most kind of terms, is open to the external medium, water that they occur in. The, uh, what is referred to as a modern chlorite. This is the opening to this water vascular system. I can see it all the way from the back. But anyone know that? Notice that white spot on that starfish central disc? That's its modern chlorite. That's its opening. To its water vascular system. You can look all you want on this one, you won't find an anus, and you won't find an object for it on the apparel and surface of the brittle star. Instead, it occurs on one of the plates surrounding the mouth. So asteroids, apparel, ultraroids, Oral. I'm going to drive the minus station of gastroid that's to do. So we have the modern chloride. And the water vascular system is formed by salomic cavities that develop in embryonic stages. We have the hydrochloride, stone canal, that enters into a rain canal. equivalent in nature travels around the disk. And then there are five radial canals that emerge from it. And if we can zoom up on one of 
space. Lateral canal that gives rise to sympathy. Two feet. upper portion that could be muscular, known as an ampulla, that through muscular contraction could cause this to elongate. There are also muscles associated with the internal muscles associated with pleasure. Ampullae are present in asteroids, but in ophiroids, ampullae are absent. So too are the suckers. Suckering ability of two of the ophiroids. So, major differences in what are vascular system of ophiroids to asteroids, location of the monitor for it, and then you know, aspects of the anatomy of the two feet, presence or absence of the ampullae, presence or absence of the sucker associated with the two feet. These are easy to remember when you think about the fact that asteroids are using. So they're much more developed with an asteroid compared to ophiroids. Any others that you all came up with? I'm checking my list. A couple more things. Well, it said to me eagerly that ophiroids were all quicker to lose their arms than in the testicles. Quicker to lose their arms. I, I, I believe that's the case, yeah. So ophiroids can atomize their arms. There's, both of these groups have the ability to regenerate arms. I know the book talks about facial mini, but that starfish in half, and then shows them out there essentially getting more starfish in their oyster beds and what they like. But so they, they both have process regeneration. In fact, that ophiroid is more likely to atomize one of their arms. There's a difference. Any others? I guess one thing we didn't have up there in terms of major functions of animals, respiration. We will be able to do this in the lab on Friday. I have to have some images we can look at. But if we look at the surface of the asteroid close up, we would see little structures emerging. Or dermal ranking gills that they use for gas exchange. These are present asteroids, but again, absent in ultroids. The other thing that we find, nobody mentioned this after reading this, one of the cool things about some echinoderms is a unique feature that asteroids have as well as some echinoids are the pedicillaria. You remember what the pedicillaria are? These are little defensive structures to prevent things from settling on it. Also, echinoids use to prevent things from settling on it. Different organisms from fouling them. Oh, and the one thing we had to discuss, yeah, we should discuss in terms of overall morphology. So overall morphology, both of these have a central disc with arms emanating from the central disc. Asteroids tend to have five arms, but not all. 
your sun starts to have lots of arms. But in ophroids, there's a clear demarcation between the disc and the arms. Whereas in asteroids, they tend to merge directly into that central disc. If the central disc is much more apparent in ophroids compared to asteroids. The other major difference is shown here. How the two feet emerge. Where the two feet occur in echinoderms are known as ambulacra. where two feet occur. And if we look in this image, we can view inside this cavity, and the and observe those two feet. If it was open a little bit further, we could see the radial nerve extending down the length of the arm. But it's got asteroids have an open, yeah, open ambulacrum or ambulacral grooves. Whereas ophiroids are closed. There is no groove. It's covered by little um, plates. There are pores from which the two feet emerge. Same thing is true for other groups. Echinoids, sea urchins, have a closed ambulacral groove and pores from which the two feet emerge. Crinoids are the only other group. that have open ambulacral groups, like we see in asteroids. So those are, at least I think, are the major differences that I've written now. And gave us an opportunity to discuss aspects of the anatomy of these, it's got a few slides that we can see that show some of the things that we've discussed. So again, stomach is contained within that central disc of the ophiroids, where as it occurs into the arms, we see the pyloric cica, the pyloric stomach, into the arms, the cardiac stomach, not so much. Sorry, the cardiac stomach is one that these spars can divert out of the body to aid in the digestion of the prey. Gonads also extending into the arms. One cool thing about, again, when we talk about radio versus bile, bilaterally symmetrical animals, where the sense organs are, any asteroids have little eye spots at the very tip of each of their arms, so they can sense light through them. Aspects of the water vascular system, this should have been what I tried to illustrate in my drawings, ladder canal and actually two feet, little sucker, showing Position of the moderate pori. One of these oral shields, five oral shields, is around the mouth. Penicillaria that occur on the aboral surface of the asteroid. The spines, the papillae, papillae. Thermal branchia, the 
shown here on the graph image of X. Asteroids avert the stomach digestive frame. It can be quite strong using the two feet to pull apart muscles. Ophiroids can filter feed. They feed in a variety of different functions. It's just a little movie showing some actually scavenging for dead shrimp. The, the video is sped up. But you can see the way they're using those arms to move. They're fighting over the floor. Piece of shrimp. They can also be very abundant in different habitats. So you can watch this one. You can see a few different conidorms and critters in here. Let me know when you see an ultra right here's a sea cucumber moving around surface bottom. Oh, there's a tube anemone, sea urchin. There should be some brittle stars. Let me know if you see any brittle stars. If there's something over there, but it might be a crab. A little fish of some sort. Another tube anemone, it looks like. More oceans. Another tube anemone. Where are the brittle stars? All those damn things you see are the arms of brittle stars sticking up. They're filter feeding. Using the arms to filter feed. So they could be, you know, this is this is the entire surface bottom. This particular location where this was filmed. They could be very numerically above it. And they have a variety of different feeding modes. These guys are still fighting over the side. And time is up, so I won't be able to talk about their life histories here, but I hope you can see how these animals do differ have distinct aspects to them, yet share a number of features in common.